Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, January 12th. Here is some of what we're talking about tonight. The Biden administration is promising schools millions of free COVID tests each month. But with major staffing shortages, are school systems even in a position to test everyone on a regular basis? Two education leaders in Georgia join us live. Getting COVID is bad enough. Having those symptoms stick around for weeks or years is something else altogether. We will dig into what researchers know about long COVID. Then imagine diagnosing an unexplained sickness in a matter of hours using DNA. Scientists at Stanford found a way and they set a Guinness World Record in the process. And we will introduce you to a woman who's making history in baseball as more women break barriers in sports. Well, school is back in session, kind of, and so we begin tonight with Omicron and education. It's been tough in some cities to get kids back to school this month, to get them there and keep them there. The White House is working to support COVID testing in K through 12 schools. The plan is to increase the number of available tests by 10 million per month. The administration says it will distribute 5 million free rapid tests to schools each month. It will also let states with high infection rates request more from the CDC. Lab capacity will also be set aside for schools to support another 5 million PCR tests per month. And the federal government will deploy surge testing units as needed. All of this comes during a heated debate over in-person learning. Many schools across the country are pivoting back to remote classes. Cincinnati's public school system is shifting to remote learning until January 24th. Officials cite, quote, ongoing staffing shortages that are the result of increased COVID-19 in the community, unquote. In Indianapolis, public high schools and freestanding middle schools are going fully remote for the rest of this week. They hope to get back on campus about a week from now. Many students and teachers are understandably unhappy about how their schools are handling Omicron. Some are letting officials know it. Here in New York, a number of students walked out yesterday in protest. This video is from Brooklyn Technical High School. Yesterday, New York City schools reported nearly 9,000 COVID cases among students and staff. This was the scene outside schools in Windsor, Connecticut, that's just north of Hartford. Teachers wore black to protest the number of tests and masks available to them. It's safe to say that most parents and teachers want students back in the classroom to get the best education possible but nobody wants anyone to get COVID. And figuring out how to move forward has sparked a lot of debates, especially between district leaders and union leaders. Meanwhile, in Georgia, school systems in and around Atlanta started the semester remotely. They've since transitioned back to in-person instruction. Georgia's Governor Brian Kemp eased COVID quarantine and contact tracing requirements in schools. In a letter to superintendents, the governor and his public health commissioner wrote, quote, students, parents, and educators have made it clear to us that they want to be in the classroom, unquote. They added that educators and staff may return to work following COVID exposure, regardless of vaccination status or the point of exposure. That's if their employer deems it necessary to ensure adequate staffing. Let's hear from education officials representing school administrations and the teachers themselves, starting with administrators. Joining us now is Mary Elizabeth Davis, the superintendent of the Henry County School System in Georgia, that is just south of Atlanta. Dr. Davis, welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. It's good to see you. Let me go back to that directive from Governor Kemp and also an op-ed that you wrote about getting students back in the classroom. You wrote that in-person learning rather than isolation provides students stability. Talk about how you are managing this directive and getting back in the classroom without putting students or teachers at unnecessary risk. Sure. Fortunately, the modification in practices uh, issued by the governor was not a requirement. Um, it was uh, allowable and an option for districts to consider in their mitigation technique. Um, Henry County Schools started the second semester with an in-person option and all of our schools open and, um, and fully staffed and running. But um, we have not shifted our practice since the fall semester um, in order to uh, really keep a stable approach to our response to positive cases. 
Um, and, and it's really been an opportunity to be precise in our decision making as we start the second semester amid this pandemic. How are you doing right now in terms of having the staff that you need, having teachers in the classrooms? I'm sure you've heard about districts that have just been tearing their hair out, trying to just keep enough staffing, staffing to keep the doors and school open. How are y'all doing in Henry County? Yeah, listen, this is not an easy time for professionals in public education, for teachers and the support staff. Um, but what I would tell you is that we are doing well. We know so much more as a country today than we did 22 months ago. And that's true about the virus and how to handle it. It's also true about our um, experience for kids who are in a virtual environment. Um, and so really as a result, uh, our approach is to look at data every single day, every positive case, every close contact, every impacted quarantine and every impacted operation. And as a result, can focus where there may be a strain very specifically. And when we do need to close a classroom or a grade level, it's communicated in a targeted and um, reliable way to our families. Um, and so we've really had a strong start. And, uh, and I'm, I'm proud of our professionals in Henry County School classrooms for being champions in this season because no doubt this is not business as normal. We heard from some parents in terms of how they are dealing with school and their children. We heard from a parent in Seattle, and granted, Seattle and the Atlanta area are vastly different places, but what she wrote interested us in terms of how she's dealing with this. Danielle writes, greetings from Seattle, where I'm on day seven of voluntarily homeschooling my third grader because I do not trust the district to move to remote in a timeline commensurate with the level of COVID risk to teachers or students. For the fifth day, we've received an email from the principal listing multiple people in the building that have tested positive for COVID. Many have been in all spaces of the building. It is simply not safe or wise to send our daughter in person. So, although not ideal, we'll be doing this until the risk substantially decreases or subsides. Stay safe. Yeah, Danielle, thank you for sending that email, and you stay safe as well, you and your little one. Superintendent, I know Seattle is a very different kind of district, but I'm sure you've had to deal with some parents who said, look, it just doesn't feel safe to send our kids to school. I wish they were on campus, but I, I just am nervous about putting my kid on campus with kids or teachers who may be a risk to them. How do you manage that? Yeah, for certain family circumstances, and for that matter, employee circumstances matter greatly in this time period. Um, for Henry County Schools, we learned by being open last year how to uh, really move away from a hybrid learning environment where teachers are doing both simultaneously and instead establish a really incredible and robust virtual alternative and for families to be able to opt into that for their learning environment if that's right for their child's learning as well as their family circumstances. It also presented this opportunity for teachers who found success or even personal preference in teaching remote to actually enter into a fully virtual teaching environment. We're actually serving um, nearly 4,000 students in that virtual school, and it has allowed those young people and families to be able to have um, the space that works for them at this time. Um, but we also know that that did not work for everybody, and it has um, afforded us the opportunity to continue to um, really focus on effective mitigation techniques um, for both employees and children who have an on-campus experience. Um, but really families have a lot of opportunity to counsel when their circumstances may require them to shift their um, place of learning. Before I have to let you go, I wonder how you're going to handle the situation moving forward. There were some reports out of Atlanta of officials doing all kinds of things, you know, principals washing dishes to just try to kind of, you know, administrators jumping into the classroom just to, to fill the gap. How do you plan to go forward, especially if this surge does not ebb, as some researchers expect? I mean, what's your plan in terms of quarantining, contact tracing, and that kind of thing? Sure. First of all, this requires a daily assessment of every um, positive case and uh, corresponding condition. There is no broad sweeping generalizations to be made in managing this pandemic and providing safe on-campus learning. So we have got to be able to pivot, which we've proven in public education we can do when the conditions require that. But we also know today that we quarantined last year and really for a year and a half now, and 98% of close contacts of a positive case on a school campus 
did not result in a positive case following. 98% of our quarantined individuals remained healthy. So schools are not the catalyst for community spread. You cannot obviously avoid when community um, transmission exists for it to reveal itself in schools. But I think it's important for us to no note that it is not more substantial in schools than it is in any other community space and place. And it is opportunity for public educators to work across our community so that everyone leans in and says, it is, it is the responsibility of everyone to do what it takes. So I can promise you in Henry County Schools, we have critical objectives that have been identified. And I myself have been in food nutrition line serving meals. Um, anyone who uh, can support a uh, driving a bus is being uh, reassigned to uh, serving in a bus uh, transportation responsibility. And all of our central office employees have been deployed to substitute positions as well as right. other support service positions. I think it's not business as normal, but we also can't normalize closing schools. And um, we are really in this season of protecting health and preserving this in-person experience. So just to be clear, just before I got to move on to our next guest, you still reserve the option to quarantine contact trace if there's an outbreak and if needed, right? Absolutely. And that's an gotcha, important gotcha. response. And we communicate every positive case to our families on any given day, along with our staff. We've got to maintain consistent practices. Gotcha. Mary Elizabeth Davis is the school superintendent in Henry County, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. Dr. Davis, these are difficult times. I appreciate you talking us through it tonight. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for having me. Let's continue now with a perspective from some of the state's teachers. Lisa Morgan is the president of the Georgia Association of Educators. Ms. Morgan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me this evening. What's your view of how teachers in Georgia are handling all of this right now between the Omicron variant, people having to jump into other roles, as we heard from the superintendent, jumping into other roles just to keep the doors open and the lights on? How are teachers in Georgia doing right now? I have heard one word from teachers all across the state this year and other school staff, and that is exhausted. Um, beginning the year, teachers were feeling that stress and strain from a third school year impacted by the pandemic. The stress of trying to support our students socially, emotionally, as well as academically, and trying to keep them physically safe and healthy is really taking a toll on our educators. The superintendent of Atlanta Public Schools has been asking for retired employers, employees to consider stepping back in as substitute teachers. What about just the staff levels in schools right now, particularly with teachers who are either sick or some of whom may have walked away and said, I don't want to do this anymore. We know that this great resignation is affecting edu education just like every other industry. It truly is. And at this point, staffing levels are a concern for a great many of our schools. I've been speaking with members across the state this week about the staffing levels and the availability of substitutes for educators who are sick or out for some other reason. And in many cases, substitutes are not available. And many of our retired educators who would have previously said, oh, yes, I would love to go back in the classroom with students, are not willing to do so in the midst of a pandemic. What's your sense of how some districts and unions have gone kind of head to head over the return to the classroom. And again, I don't want to draw too many comparisons between cities and states, but Chicago has been in the news for the last few days over the fight between the Chicago Teachers Union and Chicago Public Schools, and also with the city's mayor, Lori Lightfoot, in terms of the terms under which teachers would return to the classroom. School was closed for multiple days. Students are finally back on campus now. What about just that aspect of this, the, the labor relations piece of getting schools open again? I think that's an aspect of this that based on different situations that we have in different states is vastly different here in Georgia. But I think there is one commonality for all educators, and that is that all educators want nothing more than they want to be in the classroom with our students. But we do have the responsibility 
to protect our students' physical safety, their health, their social and emotional well-being, as well as their academic well-being. And in this instance, with this pandemic, educators for the first time have stood up and said no. Always before educators, something needed to be done. We dig down, we dig into our own pocketbooks to ensure that our students get what they need. But with this pandemic, and particularly with Omicron being so much more contagious, you're not asking this time educators to put ourselves at risk. You're also asking us to put our families at risk and our students and their families. I wonder if I could get your reaction to the the change that Governor Brian Kemp made that we mentioned earlier in terms of quarantining and contact tracing. Uh, you referred to this as a Hail Mary in an interview with U.S. News and World Report. What did you mean by that? I think it's a Hail Mary attempt to ensure that we do have adequate staffing and that schools do not have to close because they do not have staff. Um, we here in Georgia have been having record day after record day um, with new cases. Um, the report today, we are averaging 2,545 children birth to 17 who were testing positive. That's the seven day average. Educators are part of our communities and we have schools and we have school systems that have had to close and I think this was an attempt to say if you are positive but not symptomatic or if you've been exposed but not symptomatic, we want you to come to school so we have the person in the classroom. Unfortunately, I think what's going to happen is when we bring in people who may be contagious, we are hastening the time that we have more and more people out. I wonder what you see as the path forward through all of this. You know, you want people in the class, we need people in the classroom, want to keep kids safe, remote education keeps them more distant from one another, but it pales in comparison to what teachers can do in person. What's the one biggest thing that you would like to see done or that your organization would like to see done to mitigate all of this and to, to move forward from this before we go? Since the beginning, I've said I'm a kindergarten teacher. I'm an expert in classroom instruction. I'm not the expert in public health. But the experts in public health of the CDC have told us what to do. And that is everyone in any school facility on our school bus should be wearing a mask at all times. We should be encouraging vaccination, social distancing as much as possible, improving the ventilation, teaching our students and practicing good hygiene. And if someone is sick or is a positive case, they should be staying at home. Lisa Morgan, president of the Georgia Association of Educators. I appreciate, appreciate you making time for us tonight, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. There are so many things we still do not know about this virus, especially the long-term effects of it. A doctor from a COVID recovery clinic joins us next to answer your questions about long COVID. We're glad you're with us for now tonight from NBC News. Anyone who gets COVID is probably grateful to be done with it. I know I was, but sometimes we find that COVID is not done with us, not for a very long time, if ever. According to the University of North Carolina's COVID recovery clinic, up to 30% of people have lingering symptoms or health conditions after they get the illness, 30%. It's come to be known as long COVID, and it's a subject of intense research around the world. A new study from the UK's Office of National Statistics estimates that 1.3 million people there are living with long COVID. Symptoms include fatigue, shortness of breath, decreased mobility, and even anxiety disorders. Researchers are working to understand this condition and figure out how to treat it, hopefully to cure it. Joining us now is Dr. John Barada. He's the founder and co-director of UNC's COVID Recovery Clinic. Dr. Barada, welcome to the program. Hi, Joshua. Thanks for having me here. Talk about the kinds of cases you're seeing these days with long COVID, particularly with the rise of the Omicron variant. Are they different now or has it been kind of the same set of symptoms throughout the pandemic? 
That's a great question. It's a little early for us to really comment on long COVID as it relates to Omicron because long COVID uh, involves someone who has symptoms for several weeks or months. And as we know, Omicron is so new that we aren't really seeing long COVID cases that were likely caused by Omicron. What we are seeing a lot of is Delta in, in our clinic at this time, and we're still caring for patients who had some of the initial waves of COVID. I saw someone today in my clinic uh, who had COVID diagnosed in March of 2020. This is nearly two years later, and, uh, and she's coming to a, a long COVID clinic at this point. Uh, people have quite variable symptoms, um, both in the types of symptoms that they're experiencing and also the, the duration of symptoms. Can I ask you about that patient who came in March of 2020 and is still coming back? I understand there's a lot of details you can't share, but can you tell us anything about whether a case that's been going on that long is kind of typical for what we think of as long COVID or is that more of an outlier for its last years? It's unfortunately not a big outlier. We we do see a number of cases that are lasting into the, the years at this point. But I will tell you um, in kind of a more optimistic tone that a lot of people with long COVID or these persisting um, health effects after COVID do seem to gradually get better with time. And, and that's with their own body's natural recovery, as well as um, the the implementation of the right types of treatments as can be done um, from, from your physicians uh, or also a, a long COVID clinic. Is there something about this particular virus that makes it more likely to have longer term symptoms? I mean, COVID-19 is a form of a coronavirus. Coronavirus says are a thing beyond COVID. Is it something unique about this virus or are there other kinds of similar maladies that cause long-term symptoms? Uh, other coronaviruses uh, can cause lingering symptoms. Um, when, when we look at SARS and MERS uh, from years in the past, uh, those were associated with delayed recoveries. Uh, but I think what is different and, and unique about this moment in time is how contagious COVID-19 is and how many people it's uh, simultaneously affecting around the globe all at once and, and they're experiencing a lot of the same symptoms. The symptoms can be variable, but these are uh, most commonly fatigue, breathing problems, uh, memory issues, pain, uh, for example. I wonder how you separate something from something like long COVID from other conditions like COPD or if somebody's a long-term smoker, are we more likely to see that in those kinds of patients, see long COVID in those types of patients, or is it affecting people from all kinds of medical backgrounds? It affects all types of people. I, I see uh, different patient, different types of patients from um, people in their teens all the way to over 80. And, uh, and I will say that uh, when we started the clinic and, and started uh, seeing our first patients last year, I expected us to be a clinic full of, uh, full of patients who had been um, critically ill, uh, who had been like, hospitalized or on a ventilator. And while we do see those people and they, they look similar to other patients who have, need, who have had intense rehabilitation needs, we also see many people who are younger, who do not have uh, pre-existing medical issues, at least that they knew of or their doctors knew of, and, and who felt that they were pretty fit and active, um, running, um, biking, swimming, um, great, great distances, and, um, and many times functioning at a, at a very high uh, cognitive level. And then they, uh, they get knocked back from this virus and they just can't return back to their prior state of health. Before I got to let you go, let me ask you about vaccination. I know that the point of getting vaccinated is not that it can prevent you from getting infected. It's not a force field, but it can prevent you from ending up in the hospital and certainly from dying and does that rather well. How does long COVID affect vaccinated versus unvaccinated people? Uh, so I'll tell you and your viewers that uh, 
probably over 90, 95% of, of long COVID patients in our clinic had not been vaccinated at the time of their initial illness. Now, many got vaccinated afterwards. Um, some uh, chose not to get vaccinated. Some were not eligible. Um, and, and for others, the vaccines just uh, weren't authorized by, by the time that they had COVID. But it does seem that, that vaccination provides a, a great benefit to reducing the severity of illness and also perhaps the risk of long COVID. We'll know more as time goes on, as, as we're able to analyze more data, but it certainly seems that, um, that uh, being vaccinated reduces the risk of long-term effects. And if you're watching this and you would like to get vaccinated, you can do it quickly, quietly. Go to planyourvaccine.com. We can point you to the information you need to know. Doesn't have to be a big political statement. Only you and your doctor need to know about it. Planyourvaccine.com, especially in light of what we're learning about long COVID. Dr. John Barada of UNC's COVID Recovery Clinic. I appreciate you making time, doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joshua. Have a good evening. Still ahead, prices are rising fast on just about everything these days. We'll get into why so many things are getting more expensive and when we might get some relief. Just ahead, stay close. How's your household budget doing these days? If you're like most people, you probably have noticed prices going up on just about everything. New federal statistics out today confirm that it's not just you, it's inflation. Some of you told us what this looks like in your lives. Stray Cat tweeted, we're doing a home renovation that we've been waiting on since we bought the house 10 years ago. Finally have good equity, better jobs, and our costs are way, way higher than expected. Like over $2,000 for a basic exterior door. I'm an HVAC contractor too, so I see it from both sides. Ouch. And Nikki J tweeted, it's been bad at the supermarket, but I have to be honest, I believe certain stores are price gouging and using inflation as an excuse. How do we know inflation is hitting hard? The Consumer Price Index. Today, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced that the index rose 7% from last year. That is the biggest jump since June of 1982. So what's behind this increase and how long will it last? NBC News Now anchor Allison Morris joins us now to dig into that. I'm thrilled, first of all, to have a person in person. Yeah, look at us hanging out here. Like regular people. Plus the new set, gorgeous, love it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank you, much. Thank you for improving our old set. We used to hang out here Absolutely. and it didn't look this good. Absolutely. Break, us, break down some of the prices and the, the kinds of costs that have gone up in the last year. Yeah, bottom line, basically everything. I mean, you know it. Everything you do in your daily life costs more these days, right? So we have a list, you can take a look. Uh, the overall inflation, 7% on the year, but if you look at food prices up over 6%. You look at gasoline pushing 50%. And I don't need to explain that to you, right? You go to the gas station here in New York, you're paying three to four bucks a gallon. In California, they've been paying five. That is really expensive. Electricity is up. Utility pipe gas service is up. Cars, whether you want a new one or you want an old one, you're going to pay more. And there just isn't a lot of wiggle room there. I bought a new car this year and they basically said to me, you're lucky enough you're getting a car. You're not getting a deal. There just aren't good prices out there. Well, and then on top of that, our partners at CNBC have been reporting what I think we all know, which is that costs have gone up, wages have not been going up to meet them. Yeah, not at all. I mean, if you look at the median household income and then you look at the consumer price index, they're starting to go like this, those lines. I, we saw the median uh, household income come down about 3% while consumer prices went up 7%. I don't need to tell you what's going to happen if that trend continues, right? Consumer prices are going to be doing a lot better than us. And you know what that means? That people are going to have to borrow money to pay for everyday things. At the beginning of the pandemic, people weren't spending a lot. They paid off a whole lot of credit card debt. We're talking like $83 billion worth. That's changed. People can't pay for all of their daily needs. So they're putting more money on, on their credit cards. They're taking on more debt. The average household has over $150,000 in debt right now. Now, some debt's okay, right? The average person, even someone who's doing really well, they're going to take out a mortgage. Most people don't pay for their homes in cash. Most people don't pay for their cars in cash. But that credit card debt has really high interest rates, and you don't want to be carrying a lot of that. Let's talk about what the White House plans to do about mm -hmm. this. The White House released a new statement today uh -huh. on these numbers. It reads, in part, today's report, which shows a meaningful reduction in headline inflation over last month, with gas prices and food prices falling, demonstrates we're making progress in slowing the rate of price increases. At the same time, this report underscores that we still have more work to do, with price increases 
still too high and squeezing family budgets. So Allison, this says to me, the administration believes that there's something they can do about this, but also that it's a reduction in headline inflation, so this could have gone up even more in the last year? Yeah, so what they're talking about here is the December number we saw, right? So the uh, inflation in December went up half a percent. That was better than in November when it went up 0.8 percent, right? So that's good news. That 7 percent number is what we've been looking at over the whole year. So the White House is right. Things did get better in December, and if it keeps ticking down like that, we're going to be in better shape. But there's a big problem that's been going on in Washington, right? We've got this sort of catch-22. We had a pandemic happen. People were in real trouble. We needed to pump money into the economy. We needed to help people get back on their feet. We needed to help families and businesses stay alive. So what did the government do? They sent out stimulus checks. They pumped money into the economy. The Fed has been pumping money into the economy. That's great because we're not sitting here talking about a recession right now. But when you pump money like that into the economy, we're talking about inflation, and that's what we're dealing with. Since you brought up the Fed, here is some of oh, what yeah. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said when he testified on Capitol Hill yesterday. Watch. We know that high inflation exacts a toll, particularly for those less able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. If we see inflation persisting at high levels longer than expected, then, then we will, you know, then we'll, if we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. We will use our tools to get inflation back. Now, Jerome Powell has talked about inflation not being temporary or transitory is the word that he used. Can you just explain simply what the Fed can do, what levers it can pull to try to do something about the rise in prices? There is one big lever the Fed is going to pull in 2022. DJ J. Powell is going to raise interest rates. There is no question about that. The, the prevailing wisdom heading into 2022, maybe we'd see two. Then it was maybe we'd see three. Now economists are even saying that we'll probably see four. So I'm guessing uh, we don't know for sure. But if the trends continue, if we continue to see inflation not where we'd like it, when I say not where we'd like it, the 7 percent, the Fed likes inflation to be around two. So we're more than three times that. So they want to bring this down. I'm guessing they're going to raise rates probably a quarter point, maybe more in March. You'll probably see another rate hike in June. I would guess they would do one more in September and then leave the door open. December's anybody's guess if they think we need a fourth. I, I, I kind of love that you called him DJ J. Powell. I'm sure he's, my boy. There you go. I'm sure he's going to appreciate that. <laughs> One last thing before I have to let you go. Is this just kind of the way of the world now? I mean, you mentioned the Fed is okay with inflation around 2%, right? Because right? it's not that if, it, if, the, if inflation happens at all, it's an inherently evil thing. It's an indicator that we use to assess the overall health of the economy. But is this kind of inflation in a post-pandemic world... What's the smart money on whether this is just kind of the way of the world now? So it is not a great thing, but it's no surprise given what we've just come out of, right? I mean, we got our economy got rocked really hard and we came back really fast. Inflation's going to happen. Prices are going to keep going up, right? Like my parents tell me stories all the time about the 50s and 60s when you could get a Coke and a slice of pizza for a quarter. That's never going to happen again, right? <laughs> the best we could do here in New York City is a dollar slice and they're not that good. They're not. So prices should go up, but they shouldn't be going up like this. So hopefully things will cool down a little bit. Maybe Maybe we'll see more of that 2% per year, but definitely we do not want to be seeing 7% year after year. Yes, no 7% year after year and no 99 cent slices. You can do better in Manhattan. You can do better. NBC's Allison Morris, it's good to see you in person. It's, Thank you. It's so good to hang. Thanks, Joshua. And be sure to join her every day from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern here on NBC News Now. Up next, the growing power of DNA sequencing, power and speed. It's a new way to catch diseases, and it set a Guinness World Record in the process. One of the doctors behind this breakthrough joins us when we come back. Parents, imagine taking your teenager to the hospital with a cough and a fever. This is Matthew. He went to the hospital thinking he had the flu or even COVID. His condition quickly got worse and he ended up on life support. Turns out he had swelling around his heart. It's called myocarditis. The way doctors caught it is what's groundbreaking. See, Matthew's family enrolled him in a study at Stanford Medicine. Researchers were using rapid DNA sequencing to crack medical mysteries. And within hours, they'd figured it out. Three weeks later, Matthew had a new heart and is said to be doing well. Now, the technique behind this is incredibly fast. So fast that now Stanford holds the Guinness World Record for the fastest DNA sequencing technique. Five hours and two minutes. The previous record was 14 hours. So scientists can sequence your entire genetic code faster than you can fly from New York to L.A. 
But how does this technology work? And how soon might it be in the hands of your doctor? Joining us now is the senior author of that study, Dr. Ewan Ashley. He's a professor of genetics and an associate dean at the Stanford School of Medicine. Dr. Ashley, welcome. Thank you. Uh, great to be with you. When I saw this report, I was instantly fascinated. And as we were talking about this among our team, one of our producers thought about this moment in the year 2000 when President Bill Clinton announced the first map of the entire human genome. Watch. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. What's your sense, Dr. Ashley, of how far we've come in plotting more of the, the off-roads and highways and byways on that human map? Yeah, we've come really far. I mean, that project that was announced by President Clinton there was 10 years, $3 billion, 10 countries to sequence just one genome. And actually, it was even half of a genome. And in the, the last few years, we've moved on. By 2010, you could sequence a genome in about five days for about $50,000. But now we're in a position where you can sequence a human genome for about $1,000. And that by itself is groundbreaking. But being able to sequence a genome is one thing and solve medical mysteries. Being able to do it fast is another because some of our patients, especially little babies with uh, really critical conditions and the critical care units of our hospitals, they need answers faster than we can currently give them. And we can't wait around for weeks for an answer. We thought to ourselves, we'd like to see if we could do that in hours. Can you break down for us in layman's terms what the biggest challenge is to the speed of the sequencing of the genome? Is it, I would imagine it's not computer power, right? Because you can just get a more powerful computer. The, the, the speed of computers available at Stanford is probably quite staggering. But is it unraveling the genome? Is it actually reading it, interpreting the data? What's the biggest challenge? Yeah, it's a few different parts. And actually, the computers are a part of it, too. You know, we looked at every single step along the way when, that, that is required when you're sequencing a genome to try to make a diagnosis. We looked at how fast could we move the blood from the patient to the lab. Someone had to run, literally, to do that. Uh, we looked at how fast we could get the DNA out of the blood, how fast we could get it onto the sequencer. A really critical part was the sequencing machine itself. This particular machine from a company based in Oxford called Oxford Nanopore allows us to we basically produce the data for an entire genome in, in one to two hours. But then we have the issue of, of analyzing it. And although you're right, we have big computers at Stanford, we actually had to upgrade our pipes even at Stanford in order to get the data off the machine and into the compute as fast as we could. And then eventually, of course, we have to take that list of six billion data points in one genome, turn it into a list of four and a half million data points, which is the variations we each have from each other, and then finally into a short list of 20 or 30 variants in which is the smoking gun for any individual patient. And then even within that, there's a matter of being able to make diagnoses. According to the study, the diagnostic rate with this new rapid sequencing te technology was 42%. That feels way below the threshold before we're ready to kind of deploy it in larger settings or in you know hospital systems and so on. What's the next step in terms of allowing these data to lead to more useful diagnoses. Yeah, and I certainly agree we would love to see that number pushed higher, but to put that in perspective, often these conditions are ones that have been, diagnosed, have been undiagnosed from any other uh, technology possible. So in fact, many times patients are coming to the hospital critically ill or sometimes non-critically ill, and they've been going to doctor after doctor after doctor not finding answers. And one of the things that genomic medicine, the idea of applying the genome to, to medicine and the diagnosis of new conditions, is it's been able to solve conditions that, that were unsolved for years uh, with, with patients who've accumulated hundreds of thousands of dollars and stacks of paper worth of medical notes just trying to solve the condition. So the genome brings us answers where no other medical test could bring us answers. And what's new about the work we, we show today is that we can do that much faster than we used to. Instead of waiting three months for an answer, we can get the answer potentially before the end of the nursing shift in which you sent the, the DNA. A few more questions before I have to let you go. What are some of the next steps for this? Like how widespread do you see this technology potentially being applied? More generally or more in very specialized settings like Stanford? 
Yeah, I think it'll start in specialized centers. Uh, the group in San Diego has done a great, great work in this domain, our own center. Uh, we, we hope to, to let this make this available to not just our patients at Stanford, but patients further afield. But clearly, we're not able to supply this kind of technology to the entire world. So we really want to try and help teach other groups and other labs around the world how to do it and be able to get these machines and get this technology. Our own computer code will be made available, uh, open source for others to use. And we're looking forward to really trying to, to teach others how to do it so that we can bring these kind of rapid diagnoses to much, many, many more patients. And before I let you go, I just got to wonder, just on a visceral personal level, what was your reaction the first time you saw how quickly this works? I mean, what did you think? What did you say when you saw how fast it is? Oh, it, it just was incredible. I mean, my jaw was on the floor. We, we had this huge team. We had partners from Google, from NVIDIA, from the University of California, Santa Cruz, a big team, clinicians, mathematicians, computer scientists. And every week they'd come and like shave more minutes off this. And my jaw would be on the floor looking at these major uh, just achievements week on week. And then when we finally got to apply it to patients and we saw these little kids, little babies coming into the intensive care unit and being able to give them answers within 12 hours or even seven hours, 18, 18 minutes is, is the fastest diagnosis that we made. It really made a difference. And when, when we hear to those, those patients, we hear back from them what a difference it made in their lives and the ability to give them therapies that were directed to their underlying condition with a test that used to take 10 years and now can be done in less than 10 hours. That, that was really heartwarming. Really. Oh, last few seconds before I let you go, I, one more thing I almost forgot to ask. Genetic information is data. Who owns the data? Does it belong to Stanford? Does it belong to the patient? Where does that go before we go? We, yeah, we very firmly believe that the data belongs to the patient. And so we have actually offered the, the DNA genome data back to the patients. They're welcome to have it. Some of them have taken us up on that. Uh, some of them have not. Of course, medical privacy, very important. We take a lot of time uh, and energy to make sure that the data is held privately, but it, it should be owned by the patient. Dr. Ewan Ashley of the Stanford School of Medicine, really fascinating. I appreciate you explaining it to us. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Before we go, stepping up to the plate, you will meet a woman who's making baseball history. It's my dream to be able to empower people. And so, yeah, you know, that could have been many things. It could have been any profession. Um, baseball is the vehicle for empowering other people. That's it. It's been a historic week for the New York Yankees, not for something they did on the field, but off it. Today, the club introduced Rachel Balkovac as the manager of its affiliate team, the Tampa Tarpons. That's one of the teams in their minor league system. Ms. Balkovac is now the first full-time female manager in affiliated pro baseball. I don't think you sign your name on the dotted line to do something like this and then say, well, I, I don't want to be a role model. You know, I, I just don't subscribe to that. Um, people ask, you know, why are you on social media and why this? And it's like, I, I want to be a visible idea for young women. Um, I want to be a visible idea for dads that, that have daughters. You know, I want, I want to be out there. And um, it's just, I have two jobs and that's, that's fine. Rachel Balkovec is one of just a handful of women working in men's sports. She says she was all but promised one particular job a few years ago, but after weeks of waiting, the hiring manager told her something awful, and she turned that into motivation. He just said, you know, I'm really sorry. Uh, I really would like to hire you, but our administration said that we're not going to hire a woman. And he's like, I just want to be honest with you. I know this is like, it's illegal. He's like, I just want to be honest. He said, oh, it gets worse. And I was like, well, how could this possibly get worse? You just told me that you're discriminated against me. And he's like, well, I called around to all the other teams that I know have open jobs, and they all said the same thing. And then I, then it like, it was real. I was like, okay, this is going to be a bigger hurdle than I thought. Joining us now is Claire Smith, an assistant professor of journalism at Temple University in Philadelphia. She was the first woman to be inducted into the writer's wing of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Professor Smith, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Joshua. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. First of all, I wonder what your you. reaction is to this. I beg your pardon, ma'am? Sorry? I said I appreciate being here with you. Uh, thank you. Well, we appreciate having you, especially it's in light of the story that we just heard from Rachel Balkovic. I mean, 
I wonder what your reaction is to that, first of all, just being told flat out, yeah, we got this job, but you're a girl, so, uh, and we all feel the same way. Like, what, what, what the hell? Like, you just admitted to committing workplace discrimination. It, does that feel like a thing of the past to you, or is that still going on in pro sports and we just don't see it? Uh, it's still going on. It's obvious uh, that it's still going on, whether it's uh, an argument put forth by frustrated um, women uh, trying to kick down the gender uh, discrimination in front of them, whether it's race-based, um, uh, whether it's African-American men, women, uh, gender-based, uh, you, these things, it's like taking, uh, it's like taking the issue of the week. And before you know yeah. it, it's going to be replaced by another hot button topic. But I, I want to say first and foremost, this young woman's story is impressive. And, and it's kind of sad to me in a way in that so many of the things she went through are reminiscent of what Negro leaguers went through. The, the hard conditions she had to study in and, and put up with when she worked and wasn't allowed in locker rooms. So she was in these, these dirty, dingy, um, bathrooms and study sitting on the floor and, and sleeping on a mattress that she pulled out of a, a dumpster. That's, that's grit. That's someone wow. you want on your team. That really is. Could, and I'm so proud of her. Could you explain for us just in the time we have that what it means to be the manager of the Tampa Tarpons? Could you just very briefly explain that relationship in terms of its relationship to the Yankees and, and pro ball? Well, the Yankees are a team that really, really uh, look inward. If, if you're on the lowest level um, minor league team, you could be Derek Jeter and within five or six years be on the all-star team as a New York Yankee. They really promote from within. Everybody thinks they've signed free agents, but look at the uh, roster and you'll see how many homegrown Yankees there are. So to be placed on that team, to be drafted by the Yankees or signed out of the Caribbean and Latin America by the Yankees and put on that team, it's no small thing. It really isn't. Can you so talk about some of the efforts have... that are being... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said, so she's going to have a very important role in shaping uh, not only the careers, but the lives of these young men who are now in her charge. I know before I have to let you go, I, I wonder where you see the efforts to diversify gender-wise in pro sports. I mean, we've seen some of it in front of the camera, in July, we had the first MLB game that was called by an entirely female on air team between the Orioles and the Rays. Who do you think is doing a good job? In the very few seconds we have before we got to go, who do you think is doing a good job of helping to close this gender gap? I think everybody's chasing the NBA. And uh, I think the NBA has been setting the pace for a while. Baseball is coming forward with its its pledge to do uh, better by women, but it's still trying to get out of the 1980s and do better by African-American men and Latino players who want to stay in the game. Uh, these are areas that, you know, you have to put your finger in all the, all the holes in the dike to um, be able to say you're doing a great job. So baseball needs to step up in other areas. It, it took a major step up today, um, but uh, African-American young men in the minor leagues are probably saying, well, I want to be a, a manager too. Um, where's yeah. my mentor? And maybe Rachel's going to show that she's going to mentor everyone, and I'm sure she will. So this is a major step for everybody. Claire Smith, I appreciate you making time for us tonight to talk us through this. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for having me.
And thank you for making time for us tonight. Come on back tomorrow and do bring a friend. Be sure to follow us online for the latest on topics and guests at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.